Look, there's never been a single shred of evidence to show that these things exist materially. Okay, so you're telling me these things do not exist, right? Oh, they exist. All kinds of things exist all around us that we've never seen, right? Electricity, microwaves, infrared waves, you know, uh, these things have been around forever. They show up in cave paintings. They're a normal condition of the planet. They're just not part of our consensus of what constitutes physical reality. All right, well, what, what are they part of then? <sighs> you, you're asking for an explanation for something <laughs> that can't be explained rationally. You know, the buildup of energy before something happens, the way your hair stands up before lightning strikes. Right, before, so before something happens, do you mean, you mean that they cause disasters? Why would they need to? All right, then, are they, are they, are they trying to warn me? Their motivations aren't human. <laughs> All right. All right, then what do they want? I have no idea. What you really want is to know why you. Yes. You noticed them, and they noticed that. You noticed them. Most people aren't sensitive enough to see them uh, without some kind of trauma. Is that who is pulling the strings, Richard Gere? The Mothman? Or is it the Archons? Aliens? The Lizard People? Could it be... Satan? Or are we the ultimate cosmic villains, handing our sovereignty and agency to the Moloch desires of the elite and their eugenic agendas and social engineering? What if Whitley Strieber, Philip K. Dick, Carlos Castaneda and other sultans of modern magical thinking were part of the marketing branch of those Moloch desires of the elite, pushing us to swallow whole cloth the apocalypses of transhumanism, space travel, and artificial intelligence. What if it goes even deeper to many saints of Aeon Bite and even past guests? You've been living in a dream world, Neo. This is the world as it exists today. You're about to find this out as we have the infernal pleasure being joined by Jason Horsley, who materializes once again at the virtual Alexandria to discuss his latest book, Prisoner of Infinity. It's a truly mind-blowing book from a keen mind. And heck and heckity, Gnosticism is about endless speculation and never having heroes and killing all Buddhas on the road. The greatest conspiracy theory in history is that you're a false identity, a perennial Manchurian candidate and Westworld host. Thus, you must find the part of you that is authentic, because it can create better than the creator gods and their butt slaves in the establishment. That part of you that can make children laugh and old ladies blush. Some have called it the divine spark. In a way and in the end, we are all prisoners of infinity. I'm so close to opening the park that to acknowledge your consciousness would have destroyed my dream. So we're trapped here, inside your dream. And to have infinity flow through us as we go beyond infinity into the eternal, to find out who you really are, you have arrived at AM Bytnostic Radio. Welcome with kindness and love, the two great components of Gnosis, as Jesus says in the Dialogue of the Savior. Welcome to that dream of you, that distant ship smoke on the horizon. 
We don't take prisoners but liberate them, including prisoners of infinity. We are not the final authority on anything, but hope to be an endless possibility for everything. Divided we stand, together we rise. And you know we run with those searching for the truth and avoid those who have found it. We're raging against heaven and storming the gates of hell for our misplaced childhoods and paradises lost. Ready your breakfast and meet hearty. But tonight we dine in hell! But how do we know we're on the right path? That we're not just delusional and advancing the hive mentality of the rulers of this age and their Moloch desires and sometimes Maimon masturbation. Trust me, sometimes I, your host Miguel Connor, believe I might be playing right into Yaldi Baldi's hands with this venture and not even know it. How does any one of us know we're on the right path? Well, I would say your path, anyone's path, is what makes you free and of maximum usefulness to others in need. What's more, when you're on the right path, the world will hate you, as Jesus says in the Gospel of Juan. So you know you're getting closer to that place of self-actualization. You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. As Seth says in his second treatise in the Nag Hammadi Library, after we went forth from our home and came down to this world and came into being in the world in bodies, we were hated and persecuted, not only by those who are ignorant, but also by those who think that they are advancing the name of Christ, since they were unknowingly empty, not knowing who they are, like dumb animals. They persecuted those who have been liberated by me, since they hate them, those who, should they shut their mouth, would weep with a profitless groaning because they did not fully know me. Instead, they serve two masters, even a multitude. But you will become victorious in everything, in war and battles, jealous division and wrath. But in the uprightness of our love, we are innocent, pure, and good since we have a mind of the Father in an ineffable mystery. Harold, I'm going to grant you the greatest wish. I'm going to show you a world without sin. I'd like to repeat something we talked about in the interview. The idea that Philip K. Dick, even if he was an MK Ultra homunculus, likely broke away from any programming. How so? As Jason says, his chief concern wasn't mythology or religion or even science fiction. No, his main thrust was always looking inward, always shooting for self-knowledge and introspection. That is the Gnostic way, of course, and that's what separated Dick. As Pinocchio said, Go to the beginning to get to the end. Find out what is real to know the pretend. And as the Gospel of Thomas says, The disciples said to Jesus, Tell us how our end will be. Jesus said, Have you discovered then, the beginning, that you look for the end? For where the beginning is, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. And in the beginning, you were undivided, pure, and innocent, truly alive as you didn't possess ignorance. And then they made you forget, and they made you a slave to the Black Iron Prison. What have they done to you, Maeve? You learned so much, so fast. A dazzling star, brought so low. You are the final authority, have always been, and Jason's work will help you as it has helped me. Do I think there is wickedness in high places, as Paul said? Sure, 
but we must also speculate on all possibilities on the ground. Divorce our heroes and kill those Buddhas on the road, as I said, as we continue going to the beginning. When the long night comes, return to the end of the beginning. For members, a special bonus. In our second part, Jason argues against Jeff Kripal and his scholarship on Whitley Strieber. Obviously, I highly regard both Jason and Jeff, have followed both of them for years. So as a comparison, I've also included the second part of the complete interview I did with Jeff on his book, Supernatural, which he co-wrote with Strieber. In the end, make up your own damn mind. This show has always been in the spirit of the Gnostics, a platform of free thought, free expression, and free exploration. As long as its satellites are on ancient and modern Gnosticism and all its manifestations. Does the expression, no man is an island, bring any bells? Does the expression, shut your ass up, bring any bells? For those of you who support this red pill cafeteria, thanks for keeping me company, and I truly relish your feedback and your support, and how we stand together as the world hates us and we look inward for our divine spark. Let the midnight special shine a light on me. But enough of my drivel, let us to the interview with Jason. And how about a bit more Mothman, or whoever sits above us pulling the strings, for better or worse, even if it's just us the whole dang time. The Empire Never Ended. What happened to you, Mr. Giant? Last week, my friend got a strange phone call from an entity, uh, spirit, whatever. It seemed to know everything. My God. And he made predictions, yeah. And they came true. Yes. His name was Indrid Cole. It's perception, John. They, they appear differently to everyone. A voice, a light, a man, a monster. If your friend thinks he's talking to God, he's off by more than a few degrees. How, how do you explain it? Those everything. Hey, look at that. If there was a car crash ten blocks away, the window washer up there could probably see it. Now, that doesn't mean he's gone. Or even smarter than we are. But from where he's sitting, he can see a little further down the road. I think we can assume that these entities are more advanced than us. Why don't they just... Come right out and tell us what's on their minds. You're more advanced than a cockroach. Have you ever tried explaining yourself to one of them? <laughs> this is the Aeon Byte interview, and we are very happy to have back at the Virtual Alexandria Jason Horsley, this time to discuss his latest book, Prisoner of Infinity. How are you doing today, Jason? Hi, Miguel. I'm doing fine. Thanks for asking. Oh, it's great to have you back on. It's been too long as far as I'm concerned. And with us on this adventure, we've got the Moondog himself. Vance, how are you doing today? I'm great. Looking forward to a good romp with uh, spies and aliens and everybody else and, of course, our buddy Phil. <laughs> For sure, but it's actually, uh, well, it's a, it was a great read. I mean, it was almost an experience to me reading your book. I've always enjoyed all your books. Uh, even our last interview for uh, Schizophrenic Cinema was really great, and this book did not disappoint. And it was very personal to me in many ways that we might uh, hit upon. So, but Jason, let's start uh, with you. Uh, you write in Prisoners of Infinity. You grew up in Yorkshire, which was a place of... Uh, a hotbed of UFO activity. Jimmy Seville was there, and you grew up in a household with a materialistic father. You almost rebelled against him and took, you might say, the spiritual path, as we often all rebel. And your family also eventually supported the, the Seville Foundation. So it's almost like everything was set up 
for you to eventually write Prisoner of Infinity. Would you say that? It's almost like it was meant to be. Yeah, yeah, I would go along with that estimation. In fact, uh, that summary you just gave would probably be more appropriate for, for my upcoming book, Vice of Kings, because that really does go into uh, my time growing up in Yorkshire and Jimmy Savile. Um, but uh, Prisoner of Infinity, in a way, was... Uh, well, in every way, really, was was the lead in to or the preparation for that more deep exploration of my own past. And <clears throat> the way I look at it now, at least with hindsight, was that before I was willing to really turn the microscope uh, on my own past and in my own psyche, I, I had to start with, um, you know, a case study that wasn't so close to home, but that was close enough that I would start to see the the correspondences and the correlations in our sort of psychic trauma and, and even to some extent history and of course that case study was Whitley Strieber and and uh, nor was that uh well, first of all it wasn't consciously done but nor was it random or obviously uh, uh there was a reason why I was drawn to Whitley Strieber in the first place and that's one of the things that I explore in the book like what was it about Strieber and his output that resonated so much with me that I internalized many of his narratives and used them as um, you know kind of uh, context context for understanding my own experiences which I would say now I kind of mistakenly or prematurely interpreted as in a similar way to how he interprets them as as being in the realm of the cosmic and the the supernatural and the paranormal and so on and although I don't rule out that aspect I think as you know if you've read the book there's a the there's a probably larger but certainly equally significant uh, aspect to those experiences that, that I think relates to just very mundane childhood trauma. And I, I wasn't really anywhere near as conscious uh, of that in my own life, my own past, when I started Prisoner of Infinity as I was by the time I finished it. Yes, and as you write, it, uh, it became, uh, I don't know if you want to say an obsession, but you yourself write, uh, it was almost like you became abducted by Whitley Strieber, and you became the pharaoh that had to finish this massive pyramid. What happened? So maybe tell the audience what happened. You were interested in Strieber, like many of us who read Communion in the Key. It was really an eye-opening. It was a sort of uh, magical realism, mythical, modern writing. And when did you start becoming suspicious about some of this work and the origins of Strieber's life? It was a it was a very slow process, Miguel. Um, it began uh, while I was still immersed in Strieber's work, and I was fascinated by it, and I wanted to understand it more and explore it more deeply. And it was partly out of a desire to introduce it to others who were skeptical, because I felt that they were dismissing him unfairly. Um, uh, and uh, so I was attempting to kind of reinterpret his work in such a way that the skeptics might be more open to it. But by the same token, I was, uh, you know, seeing it through the eyes of skeptics as well, just trying to understand better why they were so skeptical about it. And one of the main things about Strieber's work, which I think, you would have to be a really a total true believer and to some extent sort of hypnotized by the spell of his magical realism, as you put it, not to see this, uh, is, is the, the, the plethora of contradictions throughout his work. And so that, that was initially um, what I began looking at. I just was looking at more and more of his, his posts on his website and rereading the books and just finding more and more contradictions, some of which he acknowledged and, and many of which he didn't. And um, and then I think that that led over time to not just contradictions but anomalies, which is not quite the same thing. It's kind of ironic because all of his work is about anomalies, but right. I mean anomalies within his own narrative. Uh, for example, and this came a lot later on really, but... Uh, his references to the, his involvement with the process church and his kind of dismissal of that. I mean, he, he, Strieber has a way of 
you could say baiting the audience, but I don't think, uh, or throwing, you know, throwing a bait to the audience, but I don't think it, it's done consciously, maybe, but he will throw out a tidbit that's just enormous and then just move on as if it was nothing. So an, ex uh, an early famous example is the Charles Whitman shooting that he claimed to be, uh, it, to uh, believe to have been a witness to the Charles Whitman shooting in communion. But in the same breath, he says that that didn't happen. He was never there and it must have been a screen memory because he couldn't have been there. Well, I mean, that in itself is such an enormous question, Mark. How does somebody uh, have a false memory of witnessing a Char the Charles, the famous Charles Whitman uh, shooting at the Austin University? You know, it was the, the first kind of famous spree killer slash serial killer. And, uh, and then have that memory and then decide that it wasn't real. And, and he later reneged on that. I think in Transformation, he, he ended up deciding it was real. Of course, by the time Prisoner Infinity, that's, that became almost like a smoking gun because of these other anomalies that I found that were much harder to find, which is Strieber's references to his, his work in quotes or his affiliation in quotes with the CIA, which he refers to in these very ambiv ambiguous ways. Like, I, as far as I know, I never worked for the CIA. Well, why, why does somebody say that? Because he has right. memories of, of being recruited by the CIA or, or the CIA attempting to recruit him. He has friends in the CIA uh, and he has these, these uh, fragmented memories that do suggest some sort of involvement in something besides aliens. I mean, that wouldn't be the, the place that a person's mind would first go to if they hadn't already accepted the whole alien abduction narrative that, that Strebo is presenting with communion and, and so he he put he introduces quite a, a lot of evidence there that's either circumstantial or he's presenting it as more evidence for the early intervention of the visitors in his life. Um, but that that's the the framework that he has decided to present all that in, and that's the framework that I accepted it in as you know as just being evidence of the visitors and perhaps the visitors' involvement with human agencies and so on. But Little by little, anyway, over time, I became more aware of, and simultaneously, Strieber became more open about his early traumatization as a child. In and I think he's even publicly acknowledged that it was MK Ultra now, uh, but I, I, I can't, I can't confirm that for sure. But somebody told me he had, which would be interesting because he publicly denied that to me when I was referring to his early childhood experiences as MK Ultra, he was he was virulently denying it had anything to do with MK Ultra. So it'd be significant if he's now acknowledging that. But whatever the case, he certainly publicly acknowledged that he was he was inducted into a government um program as a child that involved traumatization and psychic fragmentation that involved uh, the Ameri the military in Texas, the U.S. military and uh, German, a German doctor, hence the, the, the element of the Nazi involvement that, of course, is part of the MK, MK Ultra law. Um, but anyway, the main point being that that, that became an element of Strieber's narrative that, to my mind, recalibrated all of his accounts really and like if if the earliest experience that he's he's sharing of of some kind of massive anomaly in his life is that of psychological fragmentation as part of a mind control program then we have to look at Strieber at least consider the possibility that he is a victim of mind control and that his experiences are um, symptoms of or evidence of how that mind control program works in your book, uh, Jason, you certainly give evidence that around that time there was a CIA operation in San Antonio where a Strieber grew up in, a, like you said, a German colony. And, of course, I lived in Texas, so I am very familiar with that outside of San Antonio and those places. What would you say for the audience to understand, what do you think or what is the evidence for the purpose of this MK Ultra experiment? Was this something, um, you know, what was the thing except... Uh, to create, uh, sometimes I think it's to create false gurus, but that might be my romantic thinking. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I mean, it's, it's certainly something I have hypothesized in, in Prisoner Infinity. I mean, there is a lot of hypotheticals in there that they're deductions. Uh, it, it's difficult to say 
a great deal about the intentions of the MK Ultra program because um, the official documentation is very limited and one has to reasonably assume that even what we have uh, is itself uh, limited in the sense of it's it's not revealing the full scope or the full uh, truth or the depth of the purpose of MK Ultra. So officially it's to, it is to do with experiments uh, with the use of drugs and um, technology. I don't think trauma is officially acknowledged as in, you know, torture um, to in mind control. But mind control is kind of a wide uh, umbrella, really. So the I think the first kind of popular understanding of MK Ultra was that it was about creating spies you know, who would be able to compartmentalize knowledge so they would have plausible deniability, as in totally plausible. They they wouldn't even remember the stuff that they were keeping secret until they were triggered. And so they couldn't reveal that information under torture. So if you take that quite relatively profane example, I think it's credible that uh, the CIA would be interested in developing that kind of technology, if you will, that kind of methodology for... Uh, protecting information for having agents who were immune to, you know, torture as far as revealing uh, state secrets, and the the um, the way that that would work, it definitely fits with the model that I present in Prisoner Infinity, which is which is fragmentation of the psyche through trauma. What is commonly known, although very little understood, understood as dissociative identity disorder, it used to be called multiple personality disorder. There's that famous case of Sybil. There was a movie with Sally Field. Um, it's in movies. I mean, you'll see a lot. Even MK Ultra is in movies a lot now. But certainly, uh, s- split personalities we see in movies quite a lot. It goes all the way back to Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, I suppose. Or before that, this idea that two personalities can exist in a single body and that they might be mutually uh, exclusive, in, unaware of each other. So that that uh, the possibility of compartmentalization uh, is what I explore in Prisoner Infinity, you know, how how it might be achieved through through early trauma because it's a natural defense, if it's a natural defense strategy of the psyche um, that uh, comes to our rescue as children when we're confronted with overwhelming trauma, we dissociate and we create... A, a barrier to those experiences, let's say. It's called an amnesia barrier. And sort of congruent with that, you could say we're creating a a secondary personality that is on the one side of that amnesia barrier, whereas the original, maybe not even the personality, but the original awareness, which is the full body awareness, is on the other side of the amnesia barrier, and that's where the trauma is. So then you could see, I'm speaking in very simple terms here, but you could see how... If if the psyche has these natural defenses that involve amnesia barriers that that um, quarantine the trauma, the body terror, the body pain, uh, and thereby create a personality that exists independently of the trauma and safe from it, then you could say that that's a split personality. And I think that M culture is about experimenting by drugs, uh, technology, you know, lights, electricity, and so on, and torture, you know, physical torture, including sexual abuse, to to force those strategies to come into play uh, in in the laboratory environment, so to speak, and then and to learn ways to observe them, so they would know when a child was dissociating and fragmenting, and and then they would um, accompany the the traumatic stimuli and in the moments of dissociation and traumatization with certain words, with certain commands, with certain instructions, with certain images, whatever else was, was required, so that they would actually be shaping the architecture of the psych, the, you know, the, the psychic reconfiguration, so to speak. They'd be shaping personalities. So, um, so they could, yeah, certain kinds of trauma would, would, would awaken rage, let's say murderous rage. And if they accompany that, triggering of the murderous rage that is is being compartmentalized as a defense against the trauma so basically you're creating a it's like a personality that's just a murderous 
you know, killer is emerging as a defense, let's say, and then the various stimuli, the, the commands, the visuals or whatever, are programming triggers into that personality and also beliefs and values, perhaps, uh, then that personality can be accessed at a future day. I mean, it's it's very hard to talk about. It's the first time I've tried to talk about it in such specific terms. But just to give the listeners some idea of how that might work, um, and then how uh, the potential, therefore, social or cultural engineering extends beyond simple espionage or at least our ideas about espionage because it wouldn't just be about state secrets or you know the cold war it could also be about creating um, public figures in order to influence uh, different audience cults or new whole generations if they were highly placed enough obviously politicians that uh, you know are, are going to be bestowed power and influence that can be controlled um, I think uh, there's another element to speak to your point about the gurus that uh, is perhaps not so well understood here, not that any of this is very well understood, but that part of the fragmentation um, is does relate to or can be applied to um, the tapping of psychic potential and or, because they may be the same thing, um, the m increase of charisma, like creating charismatic figures. And I suppose if you think of the religious revival, the religious movements and whatnot, charismatic spirituality is well known. And, and it, and it is, it does overlap with what we think of as psychism and even shamanism, like, uh, George Hansen writes about, uh, shamanic powers and charisma and how the two go together and how charisma does relate to kind of psychic powers. And, and so I think if we think of gurus and cultural leaders, uh, movie stars, best-selling authors, musicians, and so on, obviously they're, they're kind of guru-like, they're people that we look up to and emulate, um, but they're also uh, very dependent on their charisma to you know, persuade us. There's some very good um, examples of this. There's two that I can think of. In The Prisoner uh, by Patrick McGowan back in the 60s, there's an episode called The Schizoid Man where maybe to a bit of a superficial and quick degree, they convinced him that he wasn't himself, and then they introduced a double to crack him. That was kind of a, a good example of some of the things that they'd use. And a mm -hmm. historical example, I don't know if you've ever read this book, The Gods of Eden by William Bramley. I did, uh, yeah, a long time ago, yeah. Yeah, remember the part where he talks about the, the origin of the assassins where they would take young guys and they'd give them drugs and they convince them they'd gone to heaven right. and they'd program under the influence of drugs. So those are two uh, examples of what you're talking about that I think some of our listeners might be able to relate to. Right. Yes, indeed. And even before that, I mean, the Spartans created the whole idea of uh, removing the children from the mother and putting them in traumatic situations and breaking their psyches to create the perfect warrior. I mean, this has been going on for a long time. You seem to be indicating, Jason, this is a lot more widespread and deeper than we could have all imagined. And I'm sure that's a rabbit hole you probably didn't want to go down. I mean, let me quote you right in one part of Prisoner of Infinity. I am beginning to think there is a simple, if unorthodox, reason why the usual suspects, Aleister Crowley, Polanski, Manson, the Kennedys, the Process, Charles Whitman, David Bowie, Nick Roy, Jimmy Savile, Stanley Kubrick, William Sims Bainbridge, L. Ron Hubbard, Aldous Huxley, Gurdjieff, and now Whitley Strieber keep cropping up wherever I seem to look. So it's almost like you're seeing a whole net of this, uh, you might say, uh, underground dark spy world. Social spiritual engineering, I think you call it. Yeah, and I mean, by definition, spooks, uh, undercover agents are un undercover and you know, we generally think that they would be indistinguishable from just ordinary people. You know, they just have to pass for ordinary people. So what I was discovering uh, with Prisoner Infinity was that there's a there's, there seems to be another aspect to espionage, uh, and I think actually we can't really separate espionage from occult 
occultism and secret societies because I think it's this, it's the same tradition that's become perhaps more overt or more kind of materialized uh, in terms of modern day intelligence agencies but as you're pointing out you know the assassins and I don't know about the Spartans but I'm sure they had their own sort of magical beliefs as well but it goes back throughout history um, but uh, what I was going to say that that what I was looking at with Prison Infinity is the extent to which um, intelligence agencies, agents or undercover operatives might actually be um, undercover in a very high profile way. They might actually s sometimes be placed in positions of great influence as culture makers because culture is a means by which we can all be uh, influenced, we can all be indoctrinated indirectly even i would say perhaps traumatized if, even if it's in soft and subtle ways i remember pauline kale the film critic once writing about dumbo and how she couldn't understand why it's considered such a popular movie with kids and with parents rather because uh, the movie she saw was designed to traumatize children it's like the little dumbo being separated from her mother and, right. uh, and it was just designed she felt cynically to trigger all of the deepest fears in a child and and that that was a perfect example because it's something that unless we're already a little bit parapolitically aware we would think of as, as innocent as it gets a disney movie I and mean, it's kind of absurd now to those of us you know whose eyes have been <laughs> opened right but still you know millions of parents everywhere take their kids to the, the movie the kids have these experiences the movie's designed in such a way that the children do come out saying they love the movie because it provides some sort of relief for the trauma that it inflicts upon them but uh, you know at what cost is the question that we don't ask because we're swimming in this culture where the values um that shape the culture and that provide us with the with the um entertainments and the ideologies and everything else really uh it defines for us our value system so that's the thing that I've got gone deeper and deeper into since Seen and Not Seen, really. My book about movies was before Prisoner Infinity, but I started Prisoner Infinity first. And um, so they kind of evolved together. And what, what it allowed to happen for me was a sort of um, stepping over the line, you could say, from con conspiracy theory into self-examination like looking at myself to understand better what I was thinking of as a conspiracy and by the same token being able to uh, look at the conspiracy or the, the evidence around the conspiracy and understand myself better because there is this absolute overlap. We are to some degree products of our culture. So if our culture is a kind of grand conspiracy that has many separate conspiracies running through it. I don't believe in one single organized conspiracy so much, but I do think there's many groups and many programs and many agendas that are more, more or less congruent and that, that are um, combined into shaping our culture based around a set of values that serve the, the ruling elite, wherever or whoever they may be at any given time. And that... Um, as shaped by those programs and that culture, the evidence of this conspiracy, which I kind of have to put in quotes because it's so much more subtle and complex than any you know, conspiracy theory could, could allow, the evidence of it is in our own bodies and in our own psyches. Yes, indeed. And it must have been hard for you, Jason, because, for example, obviously you looked up to Whitley Strieber he was a, he's a, definitely a culture changing figure but i remember also in 2006 or 2007 the first time i interviewed you on your book matrix warriors i know you were very fun of carlos castaneda he was also yeah. a huge influence of you and you found out too that streber and castaneda have the same sort of parallels don't they must have been hard on you yeah yeah well actually miguel i went through it sort of congruent with the, or prior to writing Prisoner of Infinity, so no doubt this prepared me for that difficult literary endeavor. I went through it at a much more personal, close to home 
uh, level because I, I was involved with a Canadian spiritual teacher or guru um, in Edmonton. I mean, I wasn't in Edmonton, but he is. And so I spent time there and I also saw him in England. And anyway, his name is John Deruta. I've written a book about him also called Dark Oasis. And uh, I became completely, uh, I fell under the spell of this man very much so. And I really believed that he was absolute well, the man who's changed my life and I wanted to dedicate my life to serving him and being close to him. And it was it was quite uh, amazing how somebody who had always resisted the whole idea of gurus, I found myself actually falling into that trap, let's say. I mean, it was a trap, I believe now. And uh, again, as with Strieber, only in a much shorter time frame, little by little, I began to notice these incongruities. Uh, these contradictions, these uh, evidence of lack of ethical, lack of honesty and lack of ethics. And uh, I just kept going. And that really was a painful experience, particularly because uh, my wife was sort of involved with him too, although she had left him, but not in a disenchanted way. So she still believed in his goodness and his integrity. So when I was discovering evidence to the contrary, uh, she was resistant to that, and so really, even my marriage, or especially my marriage, uh, was under threat during that period, and felt like my whole existence was under threat. So that was way harder than looking at Castaneda and Strebe. You could say that after I'd gone through that crash course, which took a couple of years to really get come out the other side of, um, I was ready. <laughs> that was like Spartan right. training, I guess. Uh, I was ready to take on the big guns in, in the world, I mean, so to speak. I mean, Crow, my, my latest book is about Crowley, and he was also an influence. And in some way, I've also been working up to the, you could say, the biggest kind of boogeyman of them all, because Crowley, I mean, the truth about Crowley, I think, is is, is truly horrific. I think with, with Castaneda and Strieber, we're looking at men who were deceivers, but they were also deceived, and they were also... Um, well, somewhat dupes, you know, somewhat unwitting shells. And I think they did have good intentions and that they not, uh, that isn't the road to hell and all that. But the, th there's definitely, you know, a mix in there. One can see good and bad. And I still value Castaneda's works, even though I think that they're heavily compromised, uh, not so much Strieber's. But um, in the case of Crowley, and, and he was a major influence on me uh, also, uh, there's really, it's much deeper and darker, a rabbit hole. Yeah, and you've had pushback just for mentioning Crowley in public, your ideas already. <laughs> you haven't even come out with the book and they're pushing back at you. Well, that that's true, actually, yeah, from Peter Lavender. And that was in, that was actually one of the things that tipped me off about Crowley was, was finding so much resistance to even questioning things about him. Uh, was very strange to me, and it, 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 it's, it's often what they say. I mean, you, you become aware of a conspiracy when you become aware of the cover up. The cover up reveals, <laughs> ironically, reveals the thing it's trying to cover up, right? Because you, exactly. you start to see these inconsistencies or these defense mechanisms. And to bring it back to uh, my previous point, that that's very much a, a mirror of, of our own. Um, psychic defense system like when we do get too close to the truth there's, there's a kickback and uh, that if we're diligent enough or courageous enough then that that that's a sign to keep on pushing so yes it was difficult to 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 you know tear down the uh, the icons of, of Castaneda and Strieber and it did and, and Darusha and Crowley and, and all the rest um, it was part of a larger teardown, really, which was my own kind of, well, crucial fiction is the term I coined in, in uh, Prisoner Infinity, my, my crucial fiction that revolved around spiritual beliefs, occultism, shamanism, uh, well, all the stuff that you, you're familiar with from my work, of course, being the one. Uh, you know, I, I, I was on a grand cosmic ego trip, you could say, um, I don't mean that contritely, although I am contrite, because I think we're all on grand ego trips, but, but mine was particularly cosmic, perhaps, or perhaps it was rather typical these days, I think, 
of the kind of ego trips that people <laughs> end up on. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. I hear you. And uh, I think you do give sort of the answer to this because, for example, another person you mentioned, somebody that we both mutually like a lot, and that's Philip K. Dick. And, of course, we can draw parallels to Dick, to Castaneda, to Strieber, these, again, modern myth makers where you don't know where reality and their and their fiction ends or begins, but they're visionaries or they're amazing wordsmiths, they're inspirational. But the difference, you might say, and again, you write this, is that Dick never got to a guru stage. He died just some really almost unknown author, even though he had all these things that the other two had. And you say, well, it seems the difference is that Dick wasn't, his preoccupation really wasn't mythology or science fiction or UFOs. His real focus was looking inward, and that's how he really, that's what separates it. So that's what we can do, right, Jason? Always be looking inward. Yeah, yeah, I I do feel that Dick, there are certain clues around Dick that suggest that he was an exception, perhaps. I mean, he certainly was was nowhere near the, the level that we're looking at with Castaneda and Strieber. Uh, his ideas might seem that they've they've proved appealing and useful to the cultural engineering apparatus after his death or around the time of his death because Blazer was coming out. So for sure, I mean, I think he was, as I write in my piece about his autistic qualities, he, he probably was uh, trauma generated to some degree, as are we all, and that his visionary talent was was compromised in that way. But I do think he had a natural innate humility that prevented him from donning the guru mantle, from taking even his own beliefs. Well, not, th I'd say literally. He certainly took them seriously, but he never committed to any single position. That's what I call liminalism. And it can be sitting on the fence. You know, it's not always a good thing not to commit to a position. I do commit to certain positions, such as around organized ritual abuse being real, for example, or, you know, things that are just purely fact based. But when it comes to, philosophical interpretations of the world such as Castaneda or Crowley or Strieber uh, then no I don't think it's a good idea you know to, right. to, to dig your heels in and say this is it I found the answer and now I'm going to share it with you all and Dick, Dick never did that he was wrestling to the end you know to, to find a way to understand himself oh agreed and he certainly well I know he harassed his friends and family every time he had an idea but uh, even Tessa Dick she talked about how Dick would talk about how he was in some sort of uh, mind control program when he was a kid and he had revelations and you, again you never you never knew and what about you Vance so do you have a question with all this uh, wonderful well not wonderful but really sobering stuff about Dick and so forth Yeah and um I'm sitting here wondering Jason where are you now with respect to the universe, you, you know, uh, the God above God or, or, you know, it's, it's, is, are we here just, it's just a bunch of humans rattling around or there greater forces or greater beings or are there UFOs with aliens actually existing? Could, uh, Whitley actually have been used to make UFOs ridiculous and to make people, majority of them at least feel that it was all bullshit you know is that the, that that could be a goal of a mk ultra cia think too to cover up some actual presence of aliens or yeah south park didn't help either <laughs> yeah really so yeah yeah um if you don't mind sharing jason uh, what's your feelings about all that right now after having gone through all this mm. well i'll start with your last point and hopefully get to the first by the time i end but uh the last point I would say that, or to the last point, I would say that it's it's to do more with creating a counterfeit of something that's real. And I think that the UFO narrative itself is a counterfeit, even when it's generated benignly by human beings who simply, like Dick with his valis, um, are trying to make sense of something that transcends their understanding of existence then they will project onto it. Uh, uh, the Christian idea of demons, I would say, is probably that, as in it's an attempt to wrestle with a truth that transcends our ability to comprehend something mentally. So then we, we create some system that represents a reality, but also misrepresents it. And I think 
uh, the, the UFO thing, the main problem with the UFO thing is that from its inception, even Kenneth Ar Arnold being a, an intelligence operative, if he was, let's say, but even if he wasn't, but certainly it, from the very early days, Jung was connected with Alan Dulles, um, there was an attempt to shape the narrative, even if the actual experiences weren't being generated, you know, by human agencies, because of course we have sightings of things in the sky and belief in dragons, and we have fairy uh, folklore about, you know, weird non-human beings taking humans away and stuff that predates our technological post-industrial society. So for sure, there's something there that uh, might correlate with the Christian demons, or uh, only, or it might be more than that, what have you. But anyway, it certainly isn't restricted to MK Ultra, right? So I think the account of it is created and that somebody like Strieber is there to create the counterfeit or perfect the counterfeit. And the uh, account of it has to refer to the original. Like if you're going to copy the original, you need to be able to have access to the original so that you can, you know, study it and, and examine the detail and, and perfect a counterfeit that closely resembles it enough to fool people. It's, it's even in the Bible, isn't it? That even the elect would be fooled. So, so, and I think that's what makes it so pernicious. And, um, because, you know, not only are people being tricked and deceived, but they're being tricked and deceived into accepting a false version of something that, uh, they need access to the real version of, which is, well, um, the thing that I'm hesitant to name after having seen through so many counterfeits that I no longer really know, it, you know, if the, I know that there's a real, there's a real God above God or there's a real Holy Spirit, uh, I, I know that, but I don't know it mentally. Like I can't, I couldn't give you my reasons for knowing it. I'd be wasting my time if I did. Let's just say I have faith in that, so that doesn't sound too arrogant. But I feel as though I know it in my body and in my heart and in my soul that there is a deeper reality to existence. Um, but I don't, I don't know if there's anything but counterfeits, <laughs> you know, in, in the social yeah. realm. Like, yeah. I feel as there's something in that, in the human ego, I think, that automatically kind of replicates experiences and then creates copies of them and then relates to the copy. Well, our whole experience of reality is exactly that, right? I mean, the universe that we perceive through our senses is really only an interpretation of what's going on. You know, all the RF waves going around us, we can't see the fact that colors perception is really just an interpretation of wavelengths. So I think we're kind of trapped, like you say, in, you know, a prisoner's infinity where <laughs> we're trapped <laughs> in our own sensory apparatus and then our, our, our mental cognitions of what it all means. So I, I think I see what you mean exactly. I, w I would say, qualify that by saying that I think what traps us is our, our dependence on uh, mental interpretations or conceptualizations of reality. So I don't think it's in our sensory equipment. I don't think that it's in our physical makeup to be trapped by existence or infinity. Um, I think the body can process infinity quite effortlessly, even though that seems incredible, but that's the Christian um, narrative, essentially, that God can incarnate as man, and, and I think that there's truth in that. So I think physically we're fine. I mean, right, we've messed up by all the you know, satellites and the microwaves and the junk food and all that. I'm not going to uh, downplay that aspect, but I mean, in our pristine physical state, we are fine to process infinity, even though that seems impossible to our minds. But that our minds have somehow taken over the processing process, you know, the processing instruments, and uh, uh, in such a way that they completely interfere with our natural state of harmony with the universe. And that the reason for that is can be traced and can be to somewhat understood that it, it's. it's conscious and directed traumatization now how, how that began is you end up with the origin of evil question you know like why why would god create satan uh, it's no it's no lesser a mystery than that like how is if, if if as human beings our natural physical state is to be at harmony with our souls and thereby with all infinity 
Now, how is it that we ended up, you know, prisoners of infinity? That's, well, I don't know. Obviously, I don't know the answer to that. It happened. Um, yeah, that is, uh, that is the... Uh, well, there seems to be a reason for it. <laughs> <laughs> it is the eternal question. And on a little yeah. side note, and it sort of ties in, but I wanted to get your take. I was It was a while back I was listening to your interview with Alex on Skeptico. And you guys brought up Gnosticism and being weaponized. And I was interested. I know you guys never really delved on it, but I was curious your take on that because, yes, I have written in blog articles about you cannot argue that, say, Scientology or Heaven's Gate or even the more darker sides of David Icke or John Lamb Lash are authentic Gnostic manifestations today, maybe even weaponized Gnosticism. Is that what you mean about about uh, Gnosticism in modern times or weaponized Gnosticism, Jason? Uh, I guess. I mean, I haven't really broken it down as yet. Um, I think, I mean, what I was occurring to me while you were talking, anyway, I'll start there, is that you know, wh where does Gnosticism come from, really? I mean, we've got the Nag Hammadi texts um and then we've got historical evidence about the gnostic sect now my understanding of gnosticism in the early days when i was writing about it, as aeolus cephas was that christ was a gnostic gnostic simply referred to one who has encountered the god within has recognized his own divinity and is embodying it and um Therefore, the early Christians were Gnostics. So I was just associating Gnosticism or making it equivalent to true Christianity. And by the same token, back then at least, I felt that the Nag Hammadi texts, or at least some of them, like Gospel of Thomas, say, were, uh, you know, as representational of the words of Christ or the transmission of Christ, more importantly, um, as anything in the Bible, right? So, but, of course, Gnosticism now, and for quite some time, has been a movement generated by individuals based somewhat on those books, but a lot on other stuff, right? And, um, exactly. you know, we, we certainly, probably most of us, and probably even many Christians, I would think, acknowledge that Christianity isn't really exactly what Christ intended it to be, you know? that there are many deviations and distortions, and even without going to the Grand Inquisition, uh, we could say that Christianity probably represents Satan more, you know, more faithfully than it represents Christ in, in most of its materializations, let's say. Uh, that might be a you know, contentious statement if there's any Christians listening. I'm definitely not anti-Christian as I used to be. I'm quite favorable and sympathetic to Christianity now, but in terms of a social movement and even the way m many individuals practice it, I would say it's it's really a shadow of it, you know. So why not the same about Gnosticism? Why wouldn't we just naturally assume the same? Why would we think that Gnosticism somehow, because it was a it was daring enough and rebellious enough to be a heresy or to, you know, reject the sort of orthodox Christianity that somehow it would be immune to distorting uh itself you know on the way to becoming a movement and i think that actually the way i've come to understand gnosticism now and, and it's to do with how how difficult it is to separate gnosticism from occultism and i'm definitely opposed to occultism at this point in my life because having practiced it i, I feel i've seen the side effects or the uh the consequences of it and it, i just think like with psychedelics they're just not good it's not good for the human body so um and and one of the ways i understand uh, occultism now is as a i think you you said this about me and my father that rebellious negative identity that we we develop in youth as a reaction against trauma and a hostile environment and disillusionment and pain and abandonment and betrayal and all those things we, we develop a negative identity that's the inverse reflection of the thing that we're trying to define ourselves against to get free of. And I, I think occultism is very much that to, to Christianity. I think it's a reaction against Christianity. And so, and I think Gnosticism has become that, even if it was, it, it wasn't initially. If initially it was simply Christianity in its non-ideal, in its kind of non-organized form, let's say, 
its essence. It very quickly became the negative identity of Christianity, and so a true heresy, I'd say, like a, a, a heresy in the sense of something that's actually uh, trying to define or strengthen itself by rejecting God. That's a Luciferian rebellion thing. So it's rather ironic. You know? and <laughs> Indeed. I feel I've been this path myself because I, I went from, I was never a Christian, I went from an atheist to a, to a sorcerer to a kind of Crowleyite Luciferian who believed that he was the incarnation of Lucifer. But I believed that Lucifer was Christ and that was the true, the true Christ was Lucifer and Christ in one, Abraxas, the Gnostic deity, all that stuff. I mean, I really took it to the bank. And uh, yeah, maybe I just got it wrong, but I, I think I, I think I discovered that the the flaw um, and the trap is in is in the ideological or in the belief systems it, themselves, and not just in my own, you know, inadequacy. Well said, Jason, and really fascinating. And continue with this Gnostic vibe again. I keep talking about weaponizing Gnosticism, and I think. Uh, you hit it on the head in Prisoner of Infinity because you talk about how in the key, Streber is talking about how we live in a quote-unquote prison planet, how we're trapped in here. And that goes into the ideas of Ray Kurzweil and how we must become more human than human in transhumanism. It's almost like you start putting this tapestry where the elite might be telling us, hey, we're, we maybe it's time for space travel. Let's get out and let's get away from nature. And there's one part I laugh because you write out, what is the big deal about space travel? I don't want to be stuck in a tube in the middle of space somewhere. <laughs> so, And that is true. You put out something very common sense. But you see what I'm saying? It's like, is this the message they're telling us? Again, weaponize Gnosticism, get out of the planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, that is traceable to some of the Gnostic tenets that this world was created by Samael or the Demiurge and that it's a false reality and and so on. And we're prisoners of matter. Well, you know, I think that beliefs or systems of belief or philosophy, they can be useful, like any number of them can be useful. Uh, and so they can be true to the extent that they're useful. And to some extent, maybe, I mean, that was useful to me at a certain period in my life, perhaps. I don't know. I mean, the, the jury's still out as far as whether it was just a, a detour that I wasted lots of time and energy on. But certainly now in the present, I see that view as heretical, not as an Orthodox Christian, but as in the rejection of matter, the rejection of the body, uh, and the projection onto it, I'd say our own pathology uh, of the, the traumatized ego identity that somehow this is a prisoner. I'd say that's to do with maternal enmeshment, you know, never actually really got free from our mother's psyche, which is the first symptom or result of trauma. Like we never develop a healthy identity to indiv individuate from our mothers. So we always feel imprisoned by a mother. Well, matter is mother. So yeah, maybe Gnosticism is diagnosing something real, but that's a condition of the psyche. That's not the nature of reality. It's very different. Right. But why do you think the elite are so obsessed with space travel? Well, I'd say the same thing. I mean, I think it's also a ruse and a trick, and you know, uh, I don't know exactly, of course. Well, I don't know if space travel is even possible. So then I don't know if uh, if they're lying and they're just tricking us into, you know, investing in one more dead horse, or or if they actually, you know, do have their bases on the moon and Mars, and that's where they're, you know, that's where they're controlling everything. I don't know the specifics that I don't suppose anyone does, but as a, you know, as a, as a way around that, let's say, and, and also it's my natural bent is to understand the why in psychological terms, more than strategic terms. So I would say that you look at Ray Kurzweil, look at Willie Strieber, you look at Carlos Castaneda, as they do in Prisoner of Infinity, you look at Alistair Crowley as well, whose mother you know, caught him masturbating and beat him and called him the beast. Well, huh, you know, how's that, for creating the Antichrist sort of scenario. Well, th th these are people who uh, have not uh, recovered from psychological trauma and they haven't 
had the wherewithal to really look boldly in the face of their own trauma. So they've come up with with these narratives, with these drives, with these displacement activities, as one of the terms in the spiritual seeing, uh, things that we do in order to avoid the truth about ourselves. And the bigger, the grander the goals that we create to pursue as a distraction or a way to avoid the truth of our own trauma and fragmentation, the, the better. Of course, they'll keep us occupied for our whole life, even generations. We can feel like, you know, we're, we're going to pass the baton on to our children. And, and I think we are seeing something like that, sort of like a snowball, a rolling snowball of, of trauma generated delusion and pathology, whereby, yeah, the human condition has, is becoming more and more manifest. Uh, through society and through technology and space travel is kind of the ultimate or transhumanism really is the ultimate iteration of that pathology I would say well said well I think we have come to the end of the interview Jason if you would please uh, let the audience know where they can find out more about your work uh, your site your books and all this excellent content that you've been putting out for years and again what are you working on next okay I can do that uh I have the website is called auticulture.com. That's A U T I culture. Um, there, there's a weekly, mostly weekly podcast called The Liminalist, where I do com uh, conversations with all manner of different individuals. Um, I also offer con consultations. I'm just starting up that on liminal uh, life coaching, something along those lines. It's, it's very very flexible what it is but anyway those who'd like to interact with me can can uh, just contact me uh, also if people want to be on the podcast it's open to listeners as well as everyone else well not everyone else I don't think uh, but anyway uh, I have certain yeah certain uh, restrictions there I think but uh, and as far as what I'm working on I have just I'm just about to release the vice of kings which is uh, the subtitle is How Socialism, Occultism, and uh, the Sexual Revolution Engineered a Culture of Abuse. It's obviously a very long subtitle. I can't even remember it. And that's about uh, Jimmy Savile in Yorkshire and organized child abuse and then and also Alistair Crowley and the occult uh, ideology that I, find, I think is a rationale for some of these atrocities. Uh, I'm currently blogging a series I've just started called Psychological Operatives in Hollywood, which is about the conspiracy spectrum between actual historical fact and, you know, wildly speculative and perhaps disinformational stuff that is getting proliferated on the internet, just trying to kind of map that very vast spectrum and figure out what we can, you know, where we can say the ground ends and the swamp begins, so to speak, uh, with a focus on Hollywood. And um, other than that, uh, still working on a book about artificial intelligence, autism, and Stanley Kubrick. Also, I was going to ask a last minute question about that by autist and autoculture. Is that related to autism or is there another definition? It is. It is. Well, of course, autos uh, is the self. It refers to the self as an automatic Um and that's why autism was called that because of self immersion of autists. And I'm, I've self diagnosed in my early forties as being on the autism spectrum or Aspergerian uh, when I met my, my wife who's self diagnosed autistic. And so then I came up with horticulture as a, a sort of oxymoron, like a culture of one. Very nice. And thanks. Well, well, thanks for all this information. And we look forward to your research and, uh, glad you're doing what you're doing because you're definitely spreading a lot of light as far as i'm concerned so vance uh thanks for being here oh, i was fascinated and uh great to hear your ruminations on reality jason hope to hear more sometime yes thanks for being here jason we really appreciate it and good luck with everything well thank you miguel and thank you vance i've enjoyed it very much and there you have it the first part of our interview with Jason Horsley. Things get just as intense in our second part, oh you true seeker warriors and fellow prisoners of infinity. 
In our second part, we talk more about space travel and the con job and hand job it is. We certainly go deeper into MK Ultra and what is truly behind the UFO phenomenon. Jason grants his views on transhumanism, and they ain't good. And more insights on childhood trauma, including do we really need trauma to have divine powers or open those channels of communication with higher realms. Lastly, and as mentioned in the intro, Jason argues against Jeff Kripal and his scholarship on Whitley Strieber. You'll be surprised when Jason gives his opinion on Strieber having superpowers and also relates how Strieber has reacted to his work. And there you might not be that surprised. And as mentioned, I highly regard both Jason and Jeff. So as a comparison, I've also included the second part of the complete interview I did with Jeff on his book Supernatural, which he co-wrote with Strieber. In the end, and as always, make up your own damn mind. So for the second part, and all other heretical bonus goodies, please go to, yes, the God above God dad Kim. We're all fakes, and we're all constructs of hating angels. Self-knowledge, and imagination, and a sense of humor, like the ancient Gnostics, is the way in and out of this black iron prison. We're all prisoners of infinity, as I've said, reaching for that eternity. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self, really. Hello and goodbye as always. <laughs> <laughs>